Okay, so um, continuing the theme of astronomical data analysis, um, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in time domain astronomy. And as Alex pointed out, there's been a real renaissance in time domain astronomy. So not thinking of astronomy as a static field, but uh, monitoring the changes and brightnesses of sources, daily changes, weekly changes, monthly, yearly, etc. And so um, I'm a member of the Center for Time Domain Inf Informatics. We are a collaboration of statisticians, astronomers, and computer scientists at uh, UC Berkeley and, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. The PI of the, the group is Josh Bloom. Um, people in red are people attending the conference. So Neurodin gave a talk earlier uh, yesterday. Uh, Dan Starr, who does a lot of our database and uh, engineering work, has been in and out over the course of the week. So these are the type of data that we um, observe with modern telescopes in the time domain. Uh, what I've plotted here on the left is a simulated time series of measurements from a type 1a supernova. And what we have here is four, time, four simultaneous uh, time series in, in four different um, optical photometric bands. And so you see that these observations are quite noisy. They're not evenly spaced. And uh, you see the uh, supernova explosion comes with a rise of brightness and then a fall off, and then it doesn't return ever again. Uh, we also observe variable stars, which are objects that, for different physical mechanisms, change their brightness on time scales from uh, less than a day to, to, to up to years. So this is a pulsating star. This is a, a Cepheid variable star. And again, you see it's not evenly spaced data. Uh, if you were to phase this on the correct period of pulsation, you would see a nice clean curve. And so the idea is uh, we're now collecting millions, soon to be hundreds of millions and billions of these types of measurements on uh, objects of uh, up to hundreds of different uh, classes of variability. At the end of the decade, as Alex mentioned, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST, will come online. And LSST is going to add a data point to each of 800 million time series every three nights. That's a tremendous amount of data. Uh, LSST has a 3.2 gigapixel camera and will collect 20 terabytes of uh, raw data per night, which is one slow and digital sky survey per night. Um, even before we have the Gaia uh, space mission, which comes online next year, and it will observe a billion stars uh, 70 times over five years. And so we have this massive amount of information, and uh, our goal as statisticians and computer scientists is to make sense of this data so the astronomers can use it for, uh, to optimize their astrophysical and cosmological inferences. So here's a schematic of the, the, the LSST uh, telescope. Uh, for scale, this is a, a person right here. Um, so LSST is going to observe something like this uh, times 400,000, and then return to uh, every three nights it will scan the entire sky, it, the entire observable sky. So what we see here is each of these little dots, um, the vast majority of them are galaxies, which may or may not host supernovae, which are exploding stars of, of different types. Um, we also have a ver variety of different types of stars, and those stars may or may not be time varying, um, which may hold, uh, which may be useful astrophysically. So uh, we're in the business of, of classification of these, these time series. There's a variety of reasons that the astronomers are interested in this type of work. Uh, first is the detection of uh, events in real time. So by events, I mean exploding things, uh, things that occur and then maybe uh, you can see their effects for a couple of weeks or up to a month and then never return. And this relates to uh, allocating expensive follow-up resources to get precise amount of information on these objects. Uh, so Alex Alea was talking about uh, galaxy spectra. Um, spectra are actually extremely expensive to get, especially for fainter and fainter objects. So before we use one of the, the biggest telescopes in the world to observe an object, we have to be pretty darn sure that it's something uh, of interest to us. 
Uh, third is to do classification to construct uh, pure and, and complete samples of objects. So for instance, type 1A supernovae are, are uh, useful for doing cosmological uh, research. The expansion history of the universe, so the accelerated expansion of the universe was uh, basically ascertained through uh, detailed study of the brightnesses of type 1A supernovae. There are other types of objects that are useful to probe the structure of our own galaxy, to understand uh, basic physics in, uh, in the universe. And then, of course, outlier detection, some of the, the best and biggest physical insights are due to uh, discovering new classes of variability and try to figure out what's going on in those. And so just because we have an LSST coming online producing all this data does not mean that discovery on, the, on these types of data streams are assured. So uh, for the first part of this talk, I'm going to talk about kind of the real-time classification work that we're doing. And then for the second half, I'll talk about more what I call retrospective classification. And so for real-time discovery, we're really interested in uh, allocating follow-up uh, follow resources as quickly as possible on the objects that we care about. The goal is to quickly sift through uh, upwards of a million. So right now, with a telescope that we work with called the Palomar Transient Factory, we have about a million uh, supernova candidates per night, and for each one we want to know uh, which are the kind of tens of objects out of those million that are actually interesting to us. In the future, that number is going to climb to uh, several orders of magnitude larger. And so we need near real-time classification, so it's not maybe the real time that some people in this room are used, uh, are used to. Uh, we're talking about minutes to hours turnaround time. Um, so uh, we need classification features on the two-dimensional images, which are used to produce a time series, and then the time series themselves. Uh, context information, so where is it? Is it close to a galaxy? If it is, it's probably a supernova. Uh, is there historical data out there? Uh, missing values are extremely common. Bad data is extremely common and must be dealt with. Um, we're really limited by both the size and scope of our training sets. And then, uh, as I said before, what it really drives all of this is resource allocation. And since we can actually put dollar amounts on amount of follow-up observation time on, say, one of the biggest optical telescopes in the world, we can actually uh, phrase our uh, classification performance in terms of telescope resources. So uh, I'm also a member of the Palomar Transient Factory collaboration. And so this is a project uh, out of San Diego in Palomar Man Mountain. And through uh, two plus years of oper operation, we have observed and spectroscopically confirmed um, almost 1,500 uh, different supernovae, uh, which is an uh, order of magnitude more than what was known previously. And so the basic data flow at Palomar is there's a 48-inch survey telescope, which is continually monitoring, monitoring the sky and producing images. Uh, those images are, are then sent to LBNL, where they're subtracted against a deep reference image. So basically, a, kind of a median averaged image from historical data. And those subtractions and the references are sent to us we we'll redo classification. And the classification is kind of two-step. First is separating all the artifacts from the real things, the, really, the truly astrophysically variant objects, which uh, is about a 1,000 to 1 ratio artifacts to reals. And then secondly, once we know it's real, we want to know, is it a supernova? Is it a variable star? So supernovae will explode and never come back. Variable stars will kind of pulsate and go up and down forever. So if it's a supernova, we want to send that information as fast as possible to Caltech, uh, wh where they will decide whether or not to follow up with other uh, telescopes to get more precise information on those objects. Right, so as I said, the, the first classification task is this real bogus problem. So these are the type of data that are sent to us. Uh, here's the new image. This is the deep reference 
image, and then here's the subtraction. So this this is real. This is a this uh, probably a, a variable star has gotten brighter over time, so it has a positive residual. It looks very clean. Um, we're about 1.5 million detections a night, so anything that kind of pops up over some sigma threshold on the image is flagged as a detection, but only 0.1% of those are, are true astrophysically variant objects. So we made a, uh, what we call a real bogus uh, classification based on those image plus some context features, and it uses a random forest classifier, which uh, was the best out of uh, about a dozen or so classifiers that we tried. And uh, so we uh, require a very small 1% false positive rate, and we see that from the beginning of the mission where our old algorithms were operating, we've decreased the misdetection rate of real astrophysically variant objects from 35 to 40% down to about 10 to 15%. So a marked decrease. Um, we recently, last year, found the most nearby supernova that's gone off in 25 years. Uh, so here's the Pinwheel Galaxy. It's uh, about 21 million light, light years away from us. And here's the supernova. It's this big, bright object. And via this image subtraction and our classification pipeline, we were the first telescope to discover that uh, the supernova had gone off. We weren't the first to detect it, but we were the first to actually turn that detection into a discovery. And this allowed us to do some detailed modeling of the explosion, and we could basically constrain uh, the time of the explosion to, to within an hour, which was unprecedented, and uh, got, got to write several nature papers. Um, as I mentioned before, one difficulty is in in, in doing these types of studies is getting clean training data. So spectroscopic follow-up resources are really expensive, so you can't be going around following up everything that you think might be real. So getting an unbiased and clean training sample is extremely difficult. Um, one, uh, one result of this real bogus classification is that we found, at least in our uh, training set and with the, the random forest classifier, uh, we're relatively insensitive to, to labeling errors in the training set up to about a 6 or 7% level. We expect the contamination to be kind of sub 1%. So this implies that if we have a, a relatively uh, good enough procedure and uh, actually obtaining training sets, the classifier does a, a relatively good job at ignoring these errors. Another way to, to get uh, training data is to use the public. So this is what's referred to as a citizen science project. It's a part of the Zooniverse. It's called the, the Galaxy Zoo Supernova Project. And basically, uh, the public can sign up and answer a bunch of questions about these uh, supernova candidates. And so over, over about the course of two years now, we have uh, several tens of thousands of uh, public monitored um, objects such as this. Uh, the public is pretty good, but they do miss uh, certain objects. This is, a, this is a confirmed type 2 supernova that, for some reason, the public did not uh, think was real. And this is a very clearly uh, real supernova. Um, so our approach was to take uh, this public data, uh, these uh, Galaxy Zoo supernova data and actually build a random forest classifier uh, using features extracted from these images plus some context information to see if we could predict what the zoo would say hours before uh, they would have time to actually look at each individual image. And what we found is that we could do a pretty good job at predicting what the zoo would say, but maybe more surprisingly, we did a better job at finding real supernovae. So these are the ROC curves, so the misdetection rate versus false positive rate, of a classifier built just on the supernova zoo scores versus our random forest classifier that was trained on the supernova zoo scores. And so it's kind of interesting that even though we trained on their scores, because the machine learner does something kind of more in a self-consistent fashion, you actually get better uh, performance overall in classification. And so now nightly we uh, basically compute the zoo score 
and the real bogus two score for each of hundreds of, of candidates. Okay, so the, the second part uh, uh, is a little bit different. It's retrospective light curve classification. So in other words, what happens at the end of the survey when we have all these time, this time series information, we've maybe followed up on some of the transients in the supernova that we could, and we have a, all these variable stars. Uh, the astrophysicists obviously want to do, uh, want to use all the data in their data set, yet uh, without good classification, it's a lot of uh, useless information for them. So the goal is to use these long baseline time series. So these surveys last typically from maybe a couple of years up to, to 10 or more years. And so we have 10 years of data, say, and millions up to a billion uh, objects. Uh, right, so we need, uh, we're talking about LSST, order 10 to the 9th sources. We need fast estimation of features, especially periodic features. So for things that are periodic, the period is uh, by far the best feature. Um, uh, training sets, again, are limited and also biased. And I'll talk about that in a bit. This is a severe limitation for the work that we do. And uh, these biases must be characterized for downstream inference. So typically, for, if we're giving someone a classification of a survey, the astrophysicist wants to use it to infer properties of the universe. So what's the rate of type 1a supernovae within the local universe? What's the structure or what's the census of our library stars within the galaxy? So unless we understand uh, all the biases in our training sets, plus uh, our false positive and misdetection rates, these things aren't that useful for the astronomers. Uh, so one of the first projects that I did with this type of data is taking now, instead of trying to determine is something a supernova or not at the time of detection, now take you know, a few months of data once the supernova has exploded and faded away to try to, to break them in the, to classify them into their subtypes. So there's, there's you know, about 10 different subtypes of supernovae. People are typically interested in, in 1As, but other people are interested in, in different subtypes. And so our uh, approach on this was to, to detect some sort of sparse structure in the entire database of, of uh, supernova time series to, do, uh, to, to uh, build a classifier. So here again, is, this is data for a single supernova. Um, the data are points are the black dots, and then if it just a, a single spline model in each of the, the bands. So our approach was to construct some sort of local dissimilarity measure between light curves, then to use the entire data set uh, of uh, the labeled plus the unlabeled data to find a low dimensional embedding, and we use a diffusion map manifold learning method. Um, then use labeled supernovae to train a random forest and predict the class of each unlabeled supernova. So for those unfamiliar with diffusion map, it's a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique. Uh, it's pretty related to uh, to Laplacian eigenmaps, local linear embedding. Um, uh, Lafon and, and Koifman and Lafon and Lee wrote papers in 2006 on the method. Uh, we've used it with a, in a variety of astronomical applications. The general idea is assume we have some data in two dimensions, uh, set up a local kernel around uh, each data point, and now run a fictive diffusion process uh, where you're only allowed to jump to nearby data points. And if you map out this random walk, uh, the, uh, the, basically the, the distance between your conditional probability vectors is a, is a really robust description of the true uh, distance uh, in your data set with respect to the geometry of the data. So in higher dimensions, that's, this is a pretty useful technique. Um, it's, it's relatively simple to set up a uh, weighted graph on your data. So each each data point here is a time series for a single supernova. Uh, the weights, we just use a Gaussian kernel with a, the local distance discrepancy measure uh, you can pick. And epsilon is a tuning parameter. Now normalize these uh, to, to, to row sum to one. And that's a transition probability matrix uh, of a Markov random walk. And then if we take the uh, biorthogonal SVD of this P matrix, then the projection of the data onto the space uh, defined by these eigenvalues and eigenvectors 
uh, has a property that Euclidean distances in that space are approximately equal to the diffusion distance, which really capture dissimilarity in our data. So we use these coordinates as features and a classifier. Um, even prior to doing classification, uh, the, the astrophysicists are always interested in physical interpretation. Uh, they want to know what the fusion coordinate 7 means, and I tell them, you don't really, it has no meaning. You just have to look at uh, <laughs> what the light curves look like uh, as you step across this space. So we can do that, and they're pretty satisfied with how these average light curves look. Um, but if the ultimate goal is prediction, then we can uh, build a classifier in this high dimensional space, and we'd actually do pretty well. Um, interestingly, uh, so th this data set is, is quite interesting. It's, uh, it was a, one of these data challenges that was run by a, uh, the Dark Energy Survey, and they wanted to basically compete all these different classifiers against one another. And so about half the people use kind of standard non-parametric non tools. The other half use physical template fittings. So they have these physical ideas about what uh, time series, what these light curves look like. And even though the data were generated by kind of similar template dictionaries that were used by, much of the, by many of the teams in doing the fitting, there wasn't a drastic difference between the non-parametric methods and the, uh, the actual physical fitting methods, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, but anyway, one of the, if not the most challenging aspect of this sort of classification is sample selection bias. So the, the training sets in astronomical applications are extremely biased. And I'll, I'll show you an example. Here are the data, again, from the supernova challenge. On the left here, I've, uh, I've plotted the kind of peak uh, magnitude, so the, the brightness, the peak brightness, versus the redshift, so the distance. And here, uh, astronomers are weird, so lower numbers means brighter. Um, so our training set consists of these extremely bright, relatively local uh, supernovae. And so the task is to build some you know, uh, non-parametric or semi-parametric model on these data to then classify this set of unconfirmed sources. And the limitation here, again, is spectroscopic observation. So spectra are extremely costly to get, especially as you go to fainter and fainter sources. And so uh, this, this problem is referred to either sample selection bias or covariate shift, depending on what field you're in. And we show with this data set that uh, if you assume a fixed amount of spectroscopic follow-up time and uh, basically run different spectro, spectros, uh, spectroscopic surveys with, with, with different uh, magnitude limits, so here as we go to the right we get fainter and fainter, we actually get better performance in terms of purity and efficiency with the fainter limits, even though you're observing much fewer uh, objects. So your training, set, uh, your training set size is much, much smaller, maybe uh, I think a, a seventh of the size as uh, this one, uh, but your performance in terms of purity and efficiency is much higher. Uh, I'll just skip ahead. So this, uh, this caused us to look at other methods for trying to alleviate these types of biases. We found that active learning is extremely appropriate. Uh, and so in active learning, if you're, if you're not uh, familiar with it, the idea is that the classifier identifies for you the set of objects that would most help the classifier in further iterations. And uh, the key is that we can judiciously follow up sources. So we want to follow up the sources that are, have the highest leverage in our classification. Uh, using random forest, we came up with a couple of heuristics for, for active learning. And on some uh, simulated data sets, we showed that compared to importance weighting, uh, self-training, co-training, it was the only method that produced any substantial uh, gains in classification rate. Uh, let's skip ahead. And uh, we recently put out a catalog uh, of this survey called the All Sky Automated Survey. So it's a classification into about 30 different types of variable star. And uh, it's kind of the, the first uh, the first catalog of its kind to actually give a probabilistic classification of astronomical uh, variability 
Uh, and we also have new things such as anomaly scores. Uh, and it's very useful. So I'll just, I'll just end by saying that uh, machine learning has been critical for all this, but both astrophysical insight and machine learning are essential. And I think having collaborations uh, between different fields is really imperative. And I'll end there and take any questions that you have. Okay, so I think the question is, so, so prior to doing any of the classification uh, for the Palomar transient factor, we do an image subtraction. And I think she was wondering if, if there are any artifacts in the image or varying conditions of observation that need to be taken to, into account when we do this. Is that, is that right? Yeah, so yes. Um, we don't do that. That's, this is done by people at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. But they have some pretty sophisticated tools for, so what happens is the, the point spread function, so basically the smearing function, uh, can vary from image to image. So they have to basically try to estimate that and try to account for it in the image subtraction. It's not a perfect process, so this is where a lot of the artifacts come from because that is an imperfect uh, uh, algorithm that they use. So often you get misalignments or you get, uh, the PSF gets so bad that you have these strange artifacts that pop up. So it is true that if that step was better, then our classification would have an easier time. In, in a sense, we're, we're kind of correcting for some of the badness that can occur in, that, in, that, in those algorithms. But they use some pretty sophisticated tools, so I, I don't know exactly what's under the hood, but 